Welcome to the All Outdoors Photography Podcast. This podcast is about all things outdoor photography, including landscapes, wildlife, macro, and more. The show features two talented photographers, Henry Doyle and Ryan Taylor, who bring their different experiences in photography to the podcast. The show is released weekly every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so I hope you sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. In today's episode, we have Theodore Emery on the show, a bird and wildlife photographer originally from Ohio. We discuss topics such as teaching others about the natural world, Theo's excellent use of color and creative composition in photos, and why being in the moment is the best mindset for your photography and enjoyment of the outdoors. Welcome back to episode 56 of the All Outdoors Photography Podcast. And today we have a very unique bird photographer on the show. Yes, we have uh, Theodore Emery on the show. Welcome, Theo. Uh, tell us more about your background and your uh, career in photography thus far. Um, so I've been working with birds for the last 10 years or so. And I started to kind of more creatively work with them when I had, when I rented out a, basically a, a really old astronomical telescope from my my college basically and then i started using an iphone to take pictures and it just kind of like spiraled out of control and i just got a i guess more or less addicted to the feeling of being able to be in the field and in the wild with birds and just really connecting with them in ways that you just you know you can do it with a binoculars a little bit you know but if you really want to take a picture of a bird the patience the level of patience and the time you spend with the species is just on another level so it's I just fell in love with the level of connection, you know, Mm -hmm. and lately I've just been, I'm in grad school, so it's been a little tough, but I've been going out on a couple trips to go owling and then also focusing this year a lot on migratory sparrows, which, you know, isn't really like, you know, a hot topic. Like everybody's after going after like snowy owls and stuff right now. I'm like, oh, the sparrows. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's awesome kind of getting a, a different subject that, I mean, especially this time of year, people, like you said, completely have their sights uh, set elsewhere. So it's great that you're focusing on those lesser, uh, less popular species. So Yeah, it's not very competitive either. I'm the only guy in the field. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. That's fair. It could be because of the, uh, the access to them because, you know, sparrows, they, they all kind of look alike and they're much smaller to identify. So maybe that's why too. Yeah, I think, you know, the subtlety of sparrows in general start to come out the more that we spend time with them. The same with any, any species, like, you know, any group of, of, of birds, you know, you, you start to really see these, these, these subtleties and they really start to take on their own, but mm-hmm. you know, like sandpipers that are migratory or migrating like clitoris birds in general, when you go out there, it's going to be like, uh, <laughs> everything looks the same, you know? So. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's great. So yeah, I noticed on your website, you've been 15 years as an environmental director and a field biologist. Uh, so maybe if you could talk more about that. Uh, environmental educator. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So Sorry. no, no. Um, basically, when I, when I was young, I kind of didn't know how to do the thing that everybody was doing. And I kind of had a real struggle in high school and ended up on a track of, you know, just barely even squeaking out a degree. And I was working at Applebee's and just kind of living the whole weird, you know, early 2000s life when I met someone that introduced me to environmental education. He was like, look, you can actually like make money teaching kids about nature. (laughs) And I'm like, wait, 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 what? (laughs) I I was just like spending like tracking animals in the woods anyway. And like, just like trying to figure out my local pitch. And so I ended up moving to Florida and just really, you know, tapping in. And then it just kind of sent me on a, a wild spiral. And I did trail work all across the, the U.S. And, you know, I've worked in adventure travel, taking kids on sailing trips in the San Juans and the Canadian Gulfs. And, you know, did a lot of like backcountry leadership stuff. And then, you know, right now I'm actually getting my uh, master's in science teaching. And so it's really birds are like a really beautiful and fun 
thing that, you know, I, I thought for a while I was going to make my life out of it. I thought I was like, oh, you know, because my good friend Ray Hennessy, he just like, he's one of the ones that was able to make a life out of it. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I can definitely do this too. And I started really trying it. But for me, for whatever reason, birds were just like, they almost seem like too close to home for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of wanted to keep it separate. And so, yeah, education is a really good way to make, to make a living that feels good and feels right. And, you know, I don't have a family and I don't have kids. So it's like pretty much, you know, the Nikon Z9 is coming up next after I get a few more. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. It also fuels the, the addiction, right? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, right. that's, that's part of it. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, so with that uh, environmental education, like what age groups do you typically work with? And like, what do you, what do you talk about? Uh, so with those? Um, I've worked with ever all the way from fourth grade all the way to uh, late high school. And so, you know, in the adventure travel portion, you know, when I was teaching sailing, like long distance sailing, a lot of times we would spend time just really talking about just what's coming up for us. And I think that it's hard sometimes, especially in an ever more kind of like digitally connected world, especially with what's going on right now, to really have all the noise and the background drop away. And what comes up then when we're in that space of silence? And I'm sure both of you have had that experience, even in the wildlife photography, when you're, mm -hmm. maybe your day is like total crap. And it's just like everything feels too intense, school, whatever it is. And then you just get out there in the field. It doesn't matter if it's a Canada goose or if it's a freaking, you know, Merlin. There's some level of some attention that pulls you out of your mind and then gets you into that state of like, I guess, like just using your senses and coming to a place of deep nature connection. And so if I was teaching at fourth grade level or if I was teaching at a high school level, it was always the same, you know, and it always is the same. Like, how can we get to that place of connected listening and sensing mm -hmm. and just let ourselves be pulled out of our own, our own narrative into something deeper, something more tangible in a way than, you know, the, uh, what's that, the treadmill of our own thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. definitely just seeing the connection as it is and um, something greater than ourselves. Exactly. As it is, is a, is a perfect way to say it because it's like, if you think you're going to make a bird do something and pose on a branch, <laughs> in a particular, <laughs> it's like, it's not going to work there, but you know, yeah. as it is, is the way it is, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah I think, um, you know, it's, it's good that you're teaching kind of non photographers too the power of nature. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I that's kind of how I first discovered it was through photography. But, you know, we forget that, you know, other people can uh, get those same experiences just by like taking a walk or just spending time outside. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's important. I think it's yeah, it's old and it's, you know, I think especially in places, especially right now, where just like there's a lot of people that I think culturally feel a little bit lost. And like, like, what's my cultural context as a person that is from the USA, right? Mm -hmm. But actually, like, deep nature connection and sitting and being in nature is a is a completely unifying cultural factor, right? That we can all say, yeah, this is mine, and I can really contribute to this and grow into this. I don't have to worry about it being anything, you know? Yeah, for sure. And like you said, it doesn't even have to be much too. I mean, you could be a simple stroll through the park for yeah. like, you know half an hour and that could be the best part of your day or even your week. Yeah. And every bit that you put into it, you get, you get something back out. Like every bit you attend to, to Blackburnian warbler and you spend time really focusing on Blackburnian warbler, learning that they like mixed open hemlock and like really seeing that pattern and looking for those places. Then it's almost like the birds are singing but also the landscape is singing the birds as well. And so you can really take it to these really deep levels where you can walk into a section of forest and say, oh man, you know, I know chestnut side of warblers here. And then boom, it sings because you're really attending to pattern and place and relationship on that level. And so you can take it all the way to that level. Or as you say, you can go for a walk in a park and, you know, see a, a peregrine fly over and be like, whoa, maybe there is still wild in this city, you know? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So during your like workshops, do you like, is there things you've learned as you go with doing those in your experience? Uh, what do you mean by workshops? Or just like anytime you're teaching people, I guess, about nature and everything. Um, will you ask the question one more time? Is there anything you've learned in your experiences, like teaching others, I'll say, or anything that may teach you? I think that, I think you can learn only so much alone. There are things that you can learn and you can learn profound and really deep tools for expressing and connecting with nature. But until we start to see, at least for me, until I start to see other ways that other people are connecting with it, then I only go so far. And when, when, when you have to teach something, I think a lot of the idea behind teaching is that we're supposed to tell somebody something and they're supposed to quote unquote, get it, right? But I think that the real teaching comes in looking at the way that somebody's interacting with nature and then meeting them in that space and asking them questions about their experience to draw that out. And I think that that's what I learned from spending time in nature and, and being with birds or being with birds a lot. You know, it's like mm -hmm. you cannot tell a bird what to do, just like you can't tell a kid what to think. <laughs> you could try, <laughs> but they're going to forget it. It's not going to mean anything. But if you mm -hmm. go into their own thinking and you meet them there and you ask them questions about their own thinking, they're going to get it and they're going to go deeper. And so that's what I learned from from teaching in nature is that the more that I do it, the less that I know. I may have seen a thousand or million things out there, but that doesn't mean I know what's coming next because it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> you know, it's like, yep. you know what I mean? I'm ready to be surprised rather than mm -hmm. ready to be confirmed in my own thinking, you know? Yeah. I mean, wow, that's that's very profound right there. Those are, those are some great words. Um, it oh, seems like <laughs> kind of the two different aspects of your life really just kind of are interweaved together. Uh, maybe indirectly, but there definitely is a connection there. Yeah, um, yeah. All the lessons you've learned. And it's awesome you can pass it along to others as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, uh, you also mentioned uh, kind of your arts uh, background in our kind of previous meeting here. So you want to go into that a bit and how that's kind of helped your photography? Yeah, you know, when I was young, I had this, my, my dad was this ridiculously eccentric engineer inventor guy and he had all these really weird and wild friends and he knew a lot of artists and so he would basically these starving artists he would give them money to kind of hang out with me and so i was exposed to a lot of different art forms from the time i was very young and from a lot of different very eccentric really brilliant talented artists but i tried painting i tried drawing and i had you know some success until, you know, my mom actually put a camera in my hand when I was 21 and just like gave it to me spontaneously. I never even thought about a camera, you know, and I became really obsessed with texture and color and composition. And I would just take these really random photographs that meant nothing to anybody at all, except for me, because I just saw these rich colors and these different like blocks and these shapes and these forms. And I remember when I was taking pictures with my Orion Star Master uh, telescope with my iPhone 4, I was really like, well, this is this is not really working for me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is when Instagram yeah. was just really kind of kicking off. And I would see people like JC Wings um, do these color blocks. And I was like, like, what is that? And I remember I was I was birding my way across the country at one point in time like I do every couple of years and just like a rampant wild spring from coast to coast. And I met a guy with a really, really big lens. And I was like, look, I've been seeing online that these people are doing this thing where they just have one solid color in the background and it's all blurred out and it just like looks really cool. And I was like, how the hell are you doing this? Right. And he's like, well, what you do is you take a picture of any single bird that you could possibly imagine and then there's this thing called Gaussian blur. <laughs> and, oh, <stop. laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Mind blown. <laughs> I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> and two weeks later, uh, this was, God, this is maybe five years ago. I met Ray Hennessy. And this is, he was only doing like three or four workshops a year at that point in time. And it was me and, and Ray G, me, me and Ray G in a workshop. 
and it was like this spring warbler intensive, like beyond the photo it was called. It was just the three of us for three days. And I remember that we were sitting in this marsh in New Jersey and I was just like, I just don't know how Ray's doing this. And so he took my lens and then he put it, he pushed it down right at the level of the water. And I saw that the foreground and the background and all the layers blurred together into solid colors in the sunrise, which was also showing a different color. And I was like, oh, rule of thirds. I'm blurring out the foreground. I'm blurring out the background. The subject is isolated and I have these blocks of color and it just clicked. Mm -hmm. And then since then, it's just like, I think about that and, and it's almost like I'm always looking like birds for me because I've studied birds all my, you know, a lot of my life and I have a really good relationship with them. That's kind of the easier part. But for me, it's the light. It's like, I'm always hunting for qualities of light and qualities of color. And as I was telling you all, when I was in Costa Rica during the first part of the pandemic, literally stuck in green for a year and a half, which is like with like the <laughs> ultimate form of suffering for someone that's a hundred percent addicted to, to color, you know, mm -hmm. and especially colors that are weird and just not often found. And everybody knows when you mess with the sliders and in, 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 in Lightroom and you warm stuff up and you bring in your magentas, but like really finding like wild, unruly color, mm. it you can just tell when it's real. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Because <laughs> it's like, what is that? <laughs> you know what I mean? There's no substitution for sure. Yeah. No AI tools powerful enough. And then it's also like, it's like, what is it? What is it going to look like at, you know, you know, 45 minutes before dawn? Or you're not before dawn. Yeah, yeah, before dawn, before the sunrise. What's going to look like 45 minutes after? And that was something Ray actually taught me. We were walking back from a beach, and it was like the sun had set 30 minutes ago, and he was just blasting frames at an oyster catcher. And I'm like, what are you doing? You know, you can't do that. And then he showed me the back of his camera. I was like, oh, wow, yeah, there's a light everywhere. I just can't perceive it with my eyes. But my camera is like a highly technical tool that's literally meant to understand and translate light. So why don't we use it for that, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so is there any particular like species you're after? Um, is it like sparrows or shorebirds or is you kind of like generalist and kind of go after everything? I mean, you know, I my Instagram account really started popping when I really got into owls, but I wasn't natively into owls. That wasn't like my, my default. I started as a passerine guy. You know, I like warblers. I like sparrows and you know i like vireos i just like passerines in general but i'd say if i could spend all day every day if i had to it would probably always be shorebirds i can spend just because the levels of creativity and light that happen in the ocean especially if you're laying in the ocean and you're shooting things around the shore and there's waves and there's qualities of light that it's just hard to get anywhere else and so I would say that like, that's my absolute, like the, my favorite thing to do is to be with shorebirds. It's just, there's nothing like it to me, you know? Mm. And I like everything else, but you know, I think with like, and Ray is taken to the next level and some others have taken the next, uh, Josh Galicki is taken to the next level around like songbirds, but they can do that. I just, you know, for me, I'm always like, oh, maybe I'll just clone out this branch real quick. <laughs> Three yeah. hours later, I'm like, wait, did I even take this photo? Like, what is this thing? That I just... <laughs> it's not the photo you started with. <laughs> yeah. So, so what do you think it is about shorebirds that you're most attracted to? Oh, hmm. I guess just kind of the way that they move and the way that they interact and the way, and I guess the elegance of form and shape and like silhouette and, and, and backlight that happens with like Godwit and Curlew and like the, the 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 details of the feather and like buff breasted sandpiper. I mean, there's there's just so much subtlety and beauty that comes with shorebirds and like the changing. Like think about like a red knot and like when it's in its you know its hatch year and like the the, the 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 just the detail in those feathers. It's like it's almost holographic, and then they shift to that beautiful bright, just like wild rufous peach color and so like shorebirds for me just really mark the passing of time and you can really find them anywhere 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, you know, an upland sandpiper in the middle of the country, you know, just Salt Lake City, you know, the Great Salt Lake has just such incredible shorebirds. And mm-hmm. yeah, there's just something wild and exposed about them too. You know, when you think about like a passerin or, you know, uh, a warbler, they're able to really dive into the trees. But a shorebird has to behave differently because they, if they didn't, the merlin is watching, the peregrine is watching. Yeah. You know, and they're going to exploit that. And I've seen it. I've seen Western sandpiper, hundreds of them flying in the sky and like, you know, a merlin cut them in half like a shark cutting a school of fish in half. And so just the, the intensity and the power of flight, especially long distance flight, long distance migration that is wrapped up in shorebirds mm-hmm. and in waders too. And just the way waders move, there's just, they're just always exciting, you know? And, and also the other piece about that is they're really accessible, really accessible. Go to a beach right now, Henry, Ryan, you will find a sanderling, mm-hmm. even if you're you know, somewhere in the Arctic, there's probably random sanderling up there. And yeah. You will get to work with it right mm-hmm. now. Or even, Not you know, in the spring season too, like along a creek bed, you'll find killdeer and spotted, uh, spotted sandpiper. sandpiper. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Spotties, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And it's just, and you'll find them when I'm in the, when I was down in the jungles of Costa Rica, there's spotted sandpipers bobbing their butt all over the place now. So it's like, (laughs) I mean, I even, I even this past August, I photographed for about five hours one morning uh, on a soccer field with yellow flowers behind them. And it was a bunch of killdeer and it was one of the funnest shoots I had last year. And it was just on a soccer field. It's crazy. Yeah. How accessible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I find like spotted sandpipers at a local community park and I'm like, what are you guys even doing here? Like there's like tons of like dog walkers and everything around them, but like here they are just like on the mud flat. It's, it's and, really cool to see that. And they're accessible and they're and they're yeah. you can you can behave in a particular way that will not spook them. Mm-hmm. And you can get they'll literally walk into your lens hood, you know? Yes. It's, it's hard to say. It's just like, how am I gonna train a warbler to do that? You know, like how am I gonna get an owl to do that? You know, so there's just something accessible and exciting about them and whimsical that I just, I can't get enough of, you know? Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. The elegance. I never really thought about that, but like, like, especially the silhouetted photos, you oh, really yeah. just show the, the shape and form. Like you said, that's really, it's a good point. Yeah. And also I think with shorebirds, I don't know if you've seen this, but like kind of the general public, don't really know about you know much of the shorebird world it's hilarious yeah it's like it's crazy like they i mean people know about plovers i find like they call every little shorebird a piping plover Uh, (laughs) but besides that it's kind of a hidden world it is and they're literally if you watch people on the beach they're literally just like kicking them out of the way yeah unfortunately Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. Not literally, but I mean, yeah. I mean, sometimes, I've seen pretty but, literal, like, yeah. like, oh, really? Getting dogs sicked at them. And, you know, I think that's the other side with shorebirds, though, is that they, because our beaches are very populated, and some beaches, like in North Carolina, you can drive cars on them and things like that. I think that because people, because they are cryptic, they are kind of invisible, that people don't you know, give them the respect they deserve and flying drones overhead and things like that. It can be really shorebird life is a difficult life. And you think about changing sea levels and just all the contributing factors that go into, into shorebird world. It's a pretty intense world. <laughs> you know, it's pretty, <laughs> like red tide. I mean, you can think about all the things they face and it's a wild, it's wild to be a shorebird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially when they're small and out of the way, like it's, <laughs> They're just really quiet most of the time, except for, say, for like Kilder mainly. But, yeah. you know, so you'd be like one lone individual and you're like, I barely passed you. Like you said, Henry, up the creek. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you like look the wrong way. It's like, wee. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, dude, I don't want to, I don't care where your eggs are. You know, it's just like uh-huh. literally just going to a class, you know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's funny. So yeah. I, I know you travel around a lot, but do you like to stay close to the home or it, do you prefer to travel I mean, abroad? I don't have, I mean, I've only been here in New Hampshire for six months. I've been traveling with birds for, you know, I mean, maybe the better part of three years. And then before that I was living in a Buddhist monastery for a couple of years. And then before that I was traveling with birds again. So uh, when you say like home, I was thinking about this the other day when I was headed west to go see some shorties. And um, 
I just because I've traveled the state so much and Latin America so much, I have I feel like I know these different places like I know like the skin on my body. Like it's there's just like different parts of myself. And so Boulevard Flats in Texas is definitely home. Like Sabine Woods in Texas is home, you know. Um it's just like Bunch Beach in Florida or, you know, Moss Landing in California or, you know, um yeah, uh, a Bear River Migratory Refuge in Utah. Like, you know, it's these are all home, you know. I was born in Ohio, uh, right where McGee Marsh is, the biggest week in birding, but you know, I, you know, everywhere is home. I don't, I don't. So when you say home, it's like, I, I don't know. Like, if I'm going to like my, my field home, my ocean home, you know, because it's right. Uh -huh. I don't have that same connection with space because I've never stood still. You know, I've been traveling consistently for, I'm almost 40 and I've been traveling for, you know, 20 years now pretty consistently. Awesome. Yeah, I guess home is relative to where you are right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if I necessarily feel like New Hampshire's home. I feel like the Northeast for me at least feels, I was talking to Kyle Tansley about this the other day who lives in Burlington, Vermont. And, you know, Northeast in a lot of ways feels kind of like a bird desert. Hmm. And just like the sheer diversity that I'm used to living in California. I'm a California resident technically, even though I'm living in New Hampshire. Um, there's just, it's non comparable, you know? being in like high energy diversity edge edge zones you know it's just it's not comparable to like a homogenous forest system like new hampshire or vermont mm -hmm. uh, do you right. still uh get out and shoot often in new hampshire or do you still kind of wait for the trips for that i uh, i have so i my next door neighbors i live on a dead end street on a lake and there's no service where i live i mean it's really it was like negative two the other morning when I was headed to work. But my next door neighbors have a ton of feeders. And so the bird, like I have, you know, chickadees and nuthatches on my porch and in my, my bushes around my house consistently. And so I just kind of will take my coffee and go sit on my porch and just shoot right there. Um, and once, once we start to get a little bit warmer, there is a really, there's kind of a birding hotspot near here. Oh, nice. this we'll go shoot but it's there's not a lot going on up here man <laughs> like i've been i've been like praying for a northern strike like i got fields i checked for northern strike you know but i will say mm -hmm. now that i am working again i am i have a four-day weekend coming up i'm like i think i'm just gonna the moment i'm done i'm gonna load up my camera and just start driving south and not really think about what i'm looking for and just kind of go and then just shoot for four days. So awesome. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Anywhere in particular you think about going? I'll probably as much as I don't want to, but I do have a friend. His name is Renee. Uh his his Instagram is not quite not quite strangers. Really cool guy. He lives out near Plum Island. And so I like Plum Island a lot. And so I'll probably go out there and then I'll probably hit south and I might try to make it to New Jersey just because in my opinion, you know, New Jersey has some of the best birding in the country um, year round. And so I might try to make it out there and then just kind of loop back up through Pennsylvania and maybe hit some of those over publicized shorty spots. But we'll just have to see if I have a taste for that. You know, sometimes I don't like to be around a lot of other photogs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah. So good luck on that. That, that definitely seems cool. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing the results uh, with that trip. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. So, do you um, prefer the shoot on the field alone, or do you like to go with groups? Or so I have, like, I'll shoot with Ray. We spent a lot of time in spring together, and I shoot with him a lot. Uh, I've shot with Scott a lot. Scott and I, well, Scott, Scott, you guys know Scott Keys. He literally, we had never met each other, and he literally took a plane to Anchorage and got in my Subaru Forester and we drove the Dalton highway and went to the, the Arctic ocean together. And so I shoot with Scott. <laughs> uh, my, wow. one of my best birding friend is, I don't know if you all know who the peck deck is. Uh, uh, Emily? Right. Yeah. Yeah. She, we shoot together as much as we can and our dispositions are perfect to photograph together. You know, uh, my other good friend, Lydia, she's Liddy bug. Uh, we love shooting together. I, I can never shoot with her enough. Uh, okay. So it's more about just like who I'm linking up with. And and there's people I want to shoot with still like Tracy. 
Uh, I would love to shoot with her. Terj, I'd love to shoot with him, but I mean, I got to get out to, you know, the Scandinavia for that. Um, like Josh Galicki and Kurum, I'd love to shoot with him. So there's a lot of people I still really want to shoot with as well, but I don't know. I like to shoot alone too, but it's something about shooting with someone just because I natively, I'm a little bit competitive. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like i don't know why this is and nobody else is competitive so it's like they have no clue that i'm like oh i better get that angle you know what i mean That's right <laughs> no clue that i'm having this whole like little other competitive world <laughs> <laughs> that's funny i was thinking something like wholesome like you share the experience together but yeah you're like i just want to no, compete no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. but like if ray gets a shot you know it's not, it's not bad. It's just fun, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting. Ryan and I, a couple of weeks ago, we were, we were shooting a snowy owl together and we just had to keep rotating angles. So we, we both got the, kind of the best perspective. So it was, it was really interesting. So, well, sometimes, it, you know, one thing I do if I'm shooting with a lot of people is I'll go to the most difficult possible angle and I will walk away and I'll find the most amount of foreground and opposition and difficulty to even get the subject isolated. And I'll go shoot there mm -hmm. because that's, I think that's sometimes where we get caught up in the idea that there is a right angle and that there is a best angle. Um, but there really isn't like, there's no right and there's no best. And so it's like, how can I do something that makes me almost like uncomfortable and miss this shot? because I'm trying something so foolish. But I think that's that's important is like you see a group of people just go like a you know, hundred yards away from them, you know, and just like make it a dot or like, you know, try something really weird and really, really different. And yeah, just get out of your own head because it's like that's the side of competition I don't buy into is like thinking that we're going to stack on top of each other more. It's more just like creativity, like Mm -hmm. How can I create something that is literally totally bizarre? <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Out of, out of the group of 10 of you shooting the same bird, it's like, let's do something that's a little more outside of the box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With snowies, they're just like, you know, they're sitting on poles all day long. And so it's like, what's, yep. what are you, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> you know what, mm -hmm. I mean? <laughs> what are you doing that sets you apart? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I, I know Ryan and I, we were like crawling around in puddles to get the foreground. Yeah. Um, you know, it worked. I mean, I think we could both agree it was it was definitely yes. worth it. So That's what's up right there is like literally getting down to the ground and just yep. scraping the hood mm -hmm. against the ground and just like mm -hmm. getting to that edge where it's just like, ah, oh, like what mm -hmm. is this that I'm even trying, you know? Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, there's, there's enough differences in our shots, but I mean, yeah, we incorporated lots of uh, foreground blur. Um, and actually, at one point, it was starting on a side, but then it did drop down to the ground level. Uh, oh, nice. Cool. Yeah, so you yeah. did get some little more natural, I guess, perch or habitat. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious, like you said, you go after a lot of owls. Um, so do you ever like come across like kind of poor lighting conditions for those owls and like how do you deal with those problems like how do you overcome uh maybe harsh light or really dark conditions like what do you do in those scenarios uh i am i am a light snob mm -hmm. and so if the light is harsh and i like pixel peep and it looks like trash uh i just i just won't even shoot it and i know some people okay. will and i know some people have done like Again, and I'm mentioning him again, but you know he's definitely changing the game. But Ray has done some stuff with harsh light lately that I'm just like, ugh, how does he do that? You know what I mean? <laughs> and he's doing it with <laughs> iPhones. But anyway, he's a different person, a different beast, right? <laughs> but um, I like overcast a lot, and I'll shoot overcast all day long. And if if you know you need a little bit more, especially with like shorties and harriers, you're gonna need a little bit more light because once it starts dropping, especially if it's cloudy and it's overcast, it's you know. There's only so much you can do, and I'm shooting a D850, so it's like megapixels out the wazoo. So you know the resolution is going to make things blurry. I can't. I just can't raise the ISO enough and get that shutter speed high enough to and preserve the quality of the color. You know. Mm -hmm. um, so with owls, I love shooting pre-dawn, especially when there's snow, because snow really reflects light really well. And I think people, I noticed I, when I, I stayed at the bog for a month. Saxon Bog for a month a couple years ago. And I noticed that I would be there 
And then about the time that I would be done and think, hey, you know, the light is starting to get trashy, that's when everybody would start shooting. <laughs> so my perception of, of <laughs> what is good, you know, uh, is I think is different than other people. You know what I mean? It's a very small yeah. window. <laughs> That's for sure. And they don't want to work as hard for it, maybe, too. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure if it's about working hard. I think it's just I have a very clear idea of light and color that I really like. And I don't know. Maybe I should be more willing to stay longer and get into that harsh stuff and see mm -hmm. if I can work it out, you know? Yeah, I mean, and just also, like, individual people, they just, some people will never see the shots you see and vice versa. Like, exactly. You know, they, could, exactly. they could have found some unique object or something that really works with the subject for them, and then, you know, you go on your own way, so. Yeah, and when I, what I'm saying, I'm, I'm not saying the things I'm saying because I think anybody else should think this, and I just want to make that clear for everybody else is listening. It's like, this is not conceit or, like, my, I mean, obviously everything has ego in it, but it's, like, more me just expressing what I love. It's more of, like, a love letter to photography, what I'm saying right now, and less of, I think anybody else should be like me, and I think everybody should be doing amazing things however they do it, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Keep, keep it true to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how far do you go into like planning a shoot or like chasing after a certain bird species? Like how much planning goes into that? So I have ideas of photos that I carry with me for years, uh, but they don't work out unless it's just something happens. Right. But species, I can go a little nuts. Like, especially when I was in Costa Rica, I would literally move to regions where I knew a species was, or somebody would tell me that, you know, colored aracaris, which are a toucan, or have a nest here. And so I literally just go there and be there with them. And so I do have a, more when I was able to travel more, I had a tendency towards spending as much time with particular species as possible, um, which is interesting because I'm very ADHD um, and I can be kind of all over the place, but yeah. I think I've really started to value being with particular species over the years. And I think owls really taught me that truthfully. Like, you know, when I shot uh, Northern pygmy owl, um, that was two and a half weeks before I even got to see one bird. And I would oh. go with Clint Clinton and I would go with Lydia um, like all the time, like all the time. And it just wasn't working out. And they'd be like, well, the owl was there yesterday. And it was like, oh, it didn't work, you know. And, and so, yeah, I always taught me to just be patient and be focused. And mm -hmm. also, what happens if you don't get the shot? What happens if you don't see a pygmy owl, you know? Yeah. At least, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. at least you got to you have fun. <laughs> yeah, what's the worst? You got to be out in nature. And, and you may see something else, yeah. too. And the worst True. thing that could possibly happen would be that you didn't see the owl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah which is always a possibility, but like you can't go into it guaranteeing you're going to see something, but like, if you don't, you know, yeah. It's not you know, it's fun. It's like, go ahead. Well, what's funny about that is that every time I'm going to go somewhere where I know that there have been owls, I'll just pretend like I don't care. <laughs> and I'll just mm -hmm. be kind of like aloof about it. But every single time I see the owl, I just like kind of my shoulders relax and I feel really <laughs> <laughs> I'm super tense up until then and uh -huh. everybody be like oh my god you know uh -huh. it was really good last night i don't know if it's gonna be good tonight i'll be like oh you know there's be some sparrows around or something like that and then i'll actually see the owl and be like oh <laughs> the payoff <laughs> i could breathe yeah i know finally <laughs> oh, <laughs> almost my. forgot for a moment yeah. <laughs> that's funny is there any like favorite stories from out the field that you have um god i don't know i have so many I, down the like three quick ones maybe i think maybe spending time with a great gray one one individual great gray in minnesota for two weeks straight and just watching it living with it completely alone and there was no one else there for two weeks and it was just me and that great gray is one i think uh probably I was I was out uh, in the spot in California called Moss Landing, and every single year around August, the shearwater migration of hundreds of thousands of shearwaters literally rams into this this point in between 
uh, Monterey and Santa Cruz. And literally the whole entire ocean is spiraling and boiling with sheer waters. And every single bird is the pelicans. Everything is going out there to be with them because they're chasing up these massive bait balls of fish. And so it's just like a total, it's just total anarchy, like absolute and total anarchy. Um, and I think maybe another one would be when I met up with my friend, in Costa Rica, and we went to go find three waddled bellbird, which uh, they um, sing in these kind of like foggy, open farm fields in Costa Rica. And they have these strangest songs and displays and these three wild, dangly, like skin flaps that are like hanging off of them. And they, you know, that one was definitely wild. It just felt the sounds and the fog and the feeling of just like being in this like just this other world and just like really because I love bird song so much. It's like, you're really, if you let yourself really lean into the song and you let yourself really be moved by it and you let yourself really be one of them in a way, you can really feel what's going on and what's, what's happening with these songs and where the boundaries of territories are and like where the limits of these birds are. And it just, I felt like I was in another world with the, the bell birds. I mean, it was, I've never seen, I've never really experienced anything like that before in sense, but yeah, I could say that about, you know, going to see Field Sparrow with Emily a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it was just wild, you know, <laughs> or just even like a, you know, an incredible flock of, uh, of mixed blackbirds with like yellow headed, uh, tricolored and, uh, red wing and just like endless waves across like Oregon marshland and, and, you know, late summer. I mean, there's, anything you know it can be anything awesome yeah just that sense of like total immersion too yeah yeah mm -hmm. just yeah just being like you know what the heck do i know you know this is this is insane <laughs> yeah <laughs> what was that that i was stressed mm -hmm. about earlier <laughs> <laughs> small matters compared to now yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so when you come across kind of these, these great experiences, do you, do you instantly pull out your camera or do you kind of observe for a bit? How do you, how do you deal with that? Um, hard to say. Um, I think when I did that, I did a big year, a couple years back of photography, uh, just trying to photograph as many species as I could. And I don't know if I know when my camera is, I'm using my camera or if I'm not. I think the answer to that question would be if my camera is with me, that I'm using it. If it's not, I'm not, but it's not detracting from it for me. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Cause my, my setup is, I really, I always dreamed of having a camera that was similar to having a pair of binoculars. So the D850 just has a remarkably clear, like, like viewfinder that's just like, just a pleasure to look through. And then the 500 F4 is just like a glorious piece of equipment. So it's like, yeah. Huh. So yeah, that's what I think. So you like kind of that optical viewfinder to get kind of that natural look? Uh, I like the Z6 viewfinder. Uh, hmm. Okay. I think it's all right. I like that you can live, like live see what you're up to. Um, but when I was in Costa Rica, I had to shoot manual the entire time. And so I don't know if I think, think in that term, any, in those terms anymore. I think before Costa Rica, I thought it was helpful, but now... I don't know if it's helpful because I kind of like sometimes the weird stuff that comes out when I mess up, mm -hmm. you know, from the optical viewfinder, but it's hard to say. I don't know. I don't, I think I like, I like cameras and I like <laughs> taking pictures of birds. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. I'm not the gearhead, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. You won't find yeah. me. You won't find uh -huh. me one of them. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, lead in with uh, asking about what gear you use actually <laughs> yeah i like my D, my it's funny i i have a d500 that was my first real my first aha camera where i was like oh my god like i should i remember shooting a picture of a a, a spotted toey and i was like holy smokes like this is this is crazy and i had a 7100 before that it was a great camera too but something about that d500 and then when i got the d850 and I started seeing those image those images out of that camera. I still am in love with that camera. Like it's awesome. maybe people have a different view on it with all this other like mirrorless stuff that's coming out. But 
I've talked to people who have moved to Canon and moved to Sony and moved because it's a Sony sensor, but I've talked to people who have moved around, but everybody loves that, the resolution on that camera, mm -hmm. everybody loves that sensor. You know. Yeah, I, I recently got uh, the R5. I, I saved up for a long time, and that that forty five megapixels that's a different difference right there. It, like it's it it's is. crazy. It the yeah. what what it's perceiving on a color level mm -hmm. is is just phenomenal. Like forty five yeah. is such a sweet spot. It's such a sweet spot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Big files, I'll say, but it's definitely worth yeah. it. But I mean, mm -hmm. Ray Hennessy was shooting mm -hmm. what like sixteen or seventeen. Yeah, uh, on his. Uh, d4s for up until a couple weeks ago so and his colors are out of this world so mm -hmm. yeah so. yeah i mean it's 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 all kind of you know how you shoot too like if you crop a lot you might want to get higher megapixel or you know if you like to print so uh, you know it's just kind of all the different use cases there so. yeah mm -hmm. yeah for sure and that, that's a good question too do you ever uh print your images uh with any of your work I've never printed a single one of my images. I've never sold a single one of my images. Um, yeah, I don't, wow. I don't. Yeah, I would love to because I don't have a house. So what am I going to print it for? You know? Right. Yeah. Uh, but enough. I don't sell my photography and I don't print my photography. I've had people do trades and my photography is in some like children's books and things like that. But I didn't charge them money to use that. And I don't charge artists to use my photography either. Uh, too, I like birds way too much to try to make a living off of them. I tried, uh -huh. but it's too painful. It just, because I love them. I love what I'm doing and to turn to, to, to wrap that up into money for me at least. And again, this is just me talking about me. This is not everybody's disposition for me. It felt like kind of like a, a bit of a violation to the five-year-old me that was like whistling and calling chickadees down to hang out with me. <laughs> you know I mean? right. <laughs> yeah. you know I mean? If I was like, uh -huh. making, he'd be like shaking his head at me. Like, what is mm -hmm. your problem, bro? <laughs> so, so you're pretty much just Instagram then as far as like sharing goes and connecting with people. Uh, I mean, I was a birder first. And so a lot of people I know, like I meet up with Texas with a bunch of birders and I was also worked as a field biologist. So a lot of my friends are field biologists as well. Oh, so. nice. Cool. Um, a lot. I have a, you know, I, I did big years before I ever had a camera. And mm -hmm. so I was just going with binoculars. Um, so yeah, hard to say. Yeah. If you kind of feel like you're selling your soul a little bit, if you tried the, you know, self, I guess, bird images. Yeah. And you know, even Instagram, like I started feeling that way. Like that you'll see, I don't really post very much anymore. I mean, I want to, but <clears throat> it's just like, I place too much of my value on like a like or a comment or something like that. And I have like an incredible group of people that I'm connected with on there. And I wish I would post more because they're all just so wonderful. Um, but it definitely messed with me. Like Instagram messed with the way that I shot, how I perceived my own worth through photography, maybe competitive and in unhealthy ways. Um, and it made me afraid to share, which is the funniest thing because it's an app meant and built for you to share. And I'm terrified to share. I'm terrified to put post anything on there because I'm so critical of my own work. And I have like, let's this folder on my desktop right now. This is just in the last week. I have 47 images that I could post and they'll never make it to Instagram. So it's a weird thing I got going on. It's this is again, this is just me. Mm -hmm. And it's like a weird self-confidence, like ego thing that I just haven't been able to get through. And I hope I do because I like it. I like to share, wow. you know. And you think that's mostly because of like comparison or fear yeah. or criticism or. If uh, like for some reason, like. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, it's just such a it's such a weird thing. And I don't know how to get through it. I've tried. I've talked to people about it, but I don't know. It's like it's. I almost want to start a new account. Hmm. I right. thought about that, and then just post whatever I want to. Like when you have like, I don't know why, but like having twenty six thousand people seeing my thing, but now probably only like what ten percent or whatever sees it. But uh -huh. um, that's a lot of people to have eyes on your work. <laughs> Yeah. That's bigger yeah. than that. That's like think about like hometowns. <laughs> like that's bigger right. than a lot of towns. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's a big big platform there. Yeah. 
I mean, you do feel. you ever get any like direct hate from people? I mean, I have only gotten direct hate from one person in my entire Instagram career. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. Yeah, and it had nothing to do with one of my photos. Oh, it was a mistake I made, and okay. I won't make it again. But I don't really want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's good with that many followers. That's a pretty good hate ratio right there. So. Yeah, <laughs> like the hate. Uh huh. Yeah, that's yeah just so that cool that new insert. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ryan. Oh, you good? I was just gonna say, yeah. It, I, it's just that weird thing with social media, I guess. It's just it like definitely transforms your mindset, and you just get in these weird things of like, are people gonna receive this photo well? And yeah. Like, yeah, it's just a weird. It's a weird thing to get into. Yeah. Go ahead, Henry. Uh, yeah. So I, I was just gonna say, with like your your second account, would you like make that like totally anonymous, anonymous, and like just kind of try to make it kind of a just un like separated from you and just kind of more hidden or i mean i think people recognize my style enough that i don't know if i could hide it okay yeah like i, I mean, have yeah a, you definitely do have a very distinct style so yeah it's like insane insanely wild weird colors like i'm not gonna change that you know and then like we like interesting different not interesting but different like levels of isolation in different places i don't know yeah and then people recognize i think more than anything people recognize my writing hmm. i can see it yeah i have a lot of people that follow specifically because i write your, your captions yeah. yeah it's like the storytelling involved is very it's very yeah. immersive and you do a great job at it yeah yeah i mean that's why i started the account in the first place is because it was almost like it's, it's always it was always for me and now it's not for me anymore so i got to try to figure out a way to make it for me again yeah but no, that's not true. It was always for the birds and it was more to get representation for them and to like really create awareness through biophilia and like this like sense of connection and immersion and hopefully that people would like fall in love with birds and want to conserve them. I mean, that was another big piece. Yeah. Right. You're almost like an ambassador for them. Yeah. I try to be. <laughs> They're kind of ambassadors for themselves. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So as we uh, end the episode here, is there anything you want to like give shout outs to inspirations i mean anything else you want to add here uh you know just like if anybody's listening to this and you know they 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 feel they feel like they 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 want to get into this and they want to do this thing and they want to go deep you know just shoot with as many people as possible and shoot alone as much as possible and just go out and just like sit and be with with yourself and be with birds and just enjoy it and don't get wrapped up in it. Don't get wrapped up in trying to be the best or be this or be that or be even being anything. You know what I mean? And just like if anybody's listening to this that that knows me um, and they're out there and I haven't talked to them in a while, uh, I'm grateful for them. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel grateful to both of you as well for putting this together and like bringing storytelling to the community because I think that that's a really important thing that we need. I think that as we move more towards like digitized and separated like realms of, you know, even like TikToks and reels and things like that, that are all looking the same. They're all the same thing. Like this really deep level of storytelling is ancient and very, very important. And so I think both of you just keep up this, 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 this thing that you got going on. We just need Thank more, you. you know, and then also if you can't, I don't know how many how many women you've had on your podcast, but maybe grab a few of those to, to get on your podcast. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're trying to get more for sure. Um, we've okay. had one great photographer on. Uh, I think, I think we, have, we have plans for a couple other more. ones. So. But cool. I definitely agree with you. It's definitely an underrepresented part of the photography community for sure. Yeah, and they're <laughs> literally blowing it out of the water. <laughs> they're all extremely <laughs> talented. <laughs> well, if you know me, yeah, send her away. Oh, I will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe your family wants to come on. <laughs> Probably not. She's pretty shy, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. No worries. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no worries. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so, well, where's the yeah, best where, place? Where can to... I go to follow your work, Theodore? Oh, sorry. Uh, wind and wing, wing on Instagram. Okay. Just click in wind and wing, and you'll find me. And it's got an owl yeah. on it. Uh, otherwise, that's the only place right now. I'm not really going anywhere else. So. Okay. Awesome. Sounds yeah. good. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on Thank tonight. For coming it's, on. it's been great. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, guys.
Yeah, you're very profound in your words, and you, you bring a great background. So get out really of here. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. Your it's imagery's amazing. great. Your personality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we mean it though. We really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Thanks, guys. Have a great rest of your night. All right. Later. Thank you so much for watching the All Outdoors Photography Podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and the video version on YouTube as well. You can subscribe down below, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you.